Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Teresa Scandifio. I'm the Director of Adult Learning here at TIFF and the program I'm in conversation with. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's In Conversation with Pete Doctor. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce your host for this evening. He is one of our favorites. Richard Krauss is the film critic for C uh, CTV's Canada AM, CTV News Channel, and CP24. He was the host of Real to Real, Canada's longest running television show about movies, and is a frequent guest on many national Canadian radio and television shows. His syndicated Saturday afternoon radio show, The Richard Krauss Show, originates on News Talk 1010 in Toronto. He is the author of eight books, including Elvis is King, Oste um, Costello is My Aim, is True. He also writes a weekly column for the Metro newspaper, and I'm sure a lot of you remember when he was on stage with Professor Del Toro, an amazing event, Guillermo Del Toro. Uh, please join me in welcoming our host for the evening, Richard Krause. Hey, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, what's going to be a really exciting, uh, cool, and enlightening conversation ahead. Uh, Pete Doctor is the Oscar-winning director of Monsters, Inc. and Up, and vice president creative at Pixar Animation Studios. Uh, his latest film, Disney Pixar's Inside Out, is scheduled to release on June 19th uh, of this year. I saw the first 56 minutes of it today, and uh, it's really something. So uh, you're in for a treat. You'll have to wait till June for that. Um, yeah, I don't, but uh, make this clear. I don't, but you will. Um, <laughs> we're going to cover uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, Pete's career, starting uh, from working at Pixar in 1990, straight up through uh, to the experience of making this new film. And it is rare, I think, uh, to have someone who is currently at the forefront, currently someone who is changing the way that uh, a certain genre or a certain kind of movie is made. And in terms of animation, Pixar does that every single day. And uh, in terms of, of movies like Inside Out and Up and Monsters, Inc., uh, Pete Doctor and friends, who will be announced later, uh, are doing that every single day working at Pixar. So it's very exciting uh, to have Pete Doctor here this evening. We're going to kick things off with a Pixar sizzle reel. Just to remind you, I know everyone here has seen all the movies a dozen times. We're going to just wet your uh, or, 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 or get you excited uh, about all this, and then we will be out uh, to start the conversation. Enjoy. Please help me welcome Pete Doctor. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This well, listen, these people are very excited. People have been uh, at me. People are waving. People are excited to see you. Look at this. Cool. Wow. Um, we're excited to have you here. And um, we're going to talk about a lot of things in the next hour or so. But I want to talk about where the love of animation comes from. I want to talk about you making your first flip book when you were yeah, eight yeah. years old and how an eight-year-old goes from watching Saturday afternoon cartoons or whatever, or going to the matinees and seeing Chuck Jones cartoons uh, to actually going, oh, I think I can do that at home. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I don't really remember. Uh, <laughs> you um, can make something up because yeah. they will believe anything you say. <laughs> <laughs> I did grow up watching Saturday morning cartoons. The Chuck Jones were all, always my favorite. Yeah. Um, Disney, you know, wonderful world that Disney would come on. This was in the old days, before even VHS. Maybe there was VHS, but we didn't have it. Right. And so you just pray, please, please be animation, please. And it'd be like, oh, Charlie the Lonesome Cougar, okay. I'll, I'll watch it anyway, you know. But um, I then discovered flip books, um, and I started drawing them like in the corners of my math book and stuff. And I made a big stack of them. And then my dad had a Super 8 camera, and I figured out, well, if I flip the flip book, and then I took it one step further and just shot one frame at a time. And so I kind of like discovered what all the old guys had known already, how animation works. It's basically you know, creating one frame at a time. And that's kind of how I fell in love with it. And it's the same thing I get to do today, mm -hmm. only we use millions of dollars worth of computer equipment instead yeah. of 39 cents worth of you know, paper. So. And rendering farms. Yeah. I just learned about rendering farms. Render farms. Yeah. yeah where you send all the information to be uh, processed. Yeah, it's a big bank of all the computers that we have that render the files. And uh, 
And in the old days, when we started on Toy Story, we set it up so that uh, when a frame would finish, it would make a sound like an animal. So, and we named all the machines cow, horse, chicken. <laughs> so it sounded like a render farm in the farm. So it was pretty cool. Now, uh, what were some of the like? What were the subjects that you were looking at when you were making these flip books? Uh, what kind of things were you telling stories, or were you just making things move, or, or what was it about those? At the very beginning, see, okay, there's always the guy. You guys probably have this who uh, sits and draws, and you're just like, wow, that's amazing. Look at that horse yeah. or the dragon or whatever. That was not me. <laughs> I wanted to be that guy, but I couldn't draw. Right. I struggled with drawing. I have my whole life. And people say that I, they think I'm good or whatever, but I, I struggle. And, but as soon as I found movement, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And so I figured at first it was just like making anything move. And then I realized, wait, when I do something funny, people like that more. <laughs> and so that kind of led me to storytelling, really. And it, it seems an odd choice to become an animator when, as you say, you can't draw very well, but it, it is m perhaps more the understanding of how motion works and, and, and how uh, it all fits together than it is the actual nuts and bolts of being able to draw a face? Well, I mean, I think out of necessity, I, I learned to draw better than I could. Right. And then when I got to Pixar, uh, I didn't have to draw, and I was happy to leave that and that struggle, daily right. struggle with uh, noses in the wrong place. <laughs> um, but I could still do the movement and the gestures and the acting, which is what I really loved. Right. And Pixar, uh, you started the day after school. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there was no messing around. You, uh, you made a straight line from uh, trainings directly into a career that you've had now for 25, 20, going on 25 years. Well, I was lucky. I was born at a good time. I credit my mom for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, big round of applause then, for the mom, right, everybody! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Up till that time, uh, basically, if you were an animator, if you were lucky, you were one of like four people who would get a job animating He-Man and the Masters of the Universe right. or something like this, which was not really high quality stuff. When I got out of school, The Simpsons was just starting up. Right. Disney was back, they were doing uh, Little Mermaid, just starting up on that, and Pixar was hiring. So I had all this opportunity, but for whatever weird reason, and nobody knew about Pixar. At this time, mm -hmm. it basically made hardware as a company. They'd done some of the short films. But I, you know, I kind of look back and scratch my head and say, why did I decide to go to this computer hardware company instead of going to Disney or some of these other yeah. places? And I think the answer is the short films that John Lasseter right. and the other guys did. Uh, they're just fantastic, and that's what got me hooked. And what were those early days like? You know, I had this idea that it's just this bubbling beehive of creativity, and is it? Or, or was it like that at the time? Because they weren't, you know, at the time, they weren't making Toy Story yet, right. shortly after you got there, but they, they weren't doing that work yet. Right. Yeah, no, they were doing, uh, we, we, were, we were doing short films and some commercials. They just started up commercials. It was kind of like hanging out in your friend's garage <laughs> making stuff just for fun right. you know it was about that level of like the furniture was at about that level too it was not like a fancy place um, and we would draw on the walls and have uh, paintball fights and, and laser tag in the hallways and stuff like that um, just because it was fun and, and it was a rental <laughs> the building was a rental um, and then, you know, as, as we got going, it, it slowly evolved and we hired more people and so on. So. Was that kind of anything go spirit, uh, did that feed the creativity that yeah. you may have felt in there? I mean, it, it, it seems like it was, I don't, you know, I don't know, wild's the word, but it certainly, you know, you were, you were free to experiment. I think so. Um, there's something that I, I notice in, in other people that we've gotten a chance to, I can't believe that I've gotten a chance to work with people like Amy Poehler, but she mm -hmm. has a similar thing to what was going on at Pixar, which is, let's make this a fun thing. Right. Like any situation, uh, when Jonas R Rivera, producer, and I met her for the first time, it was in an elevator, and she was right away goofing around with people and having fun. And like, it's almost like her brain says, how can I make this interesting, you know? Right. Um, and Pixar was kind of like that too, where we would, anytime new computers would come up, we'd be like, ooh, how can I use, I can send sounds to that other computer and make it, make embarrassing sounds <laughs> over by that guy's machine, okay. You know, so it was all like tools to goof around with. Right. And we spent a lot of time doing that. <laughs> and then, so you're making commercials, short films, that sort of thing, and then someone comes up with the idea of kicking around for Toy Story. And you were one of the people that helped create 
the characters, one of three people that helped create the main characters in Toy Story. And you've said that uh, each one of you uh, identified with a different character. So yeah. I guess the obvious question is, which character <laughs> were you most identify, or do you most identify with? And and how does that process work? Because I understand that film is, by its very nature, a collaborative mm -hmm. process, and it has to be. I mean, there's hundreds of people working on anything. But from what I understand, Pixar takes that even one step further than you would on on almost any other film. Like, mm. I mean, everyone seems to be working together in this amorphous kind of way that that is, I think, a little bit unusual. Yeah, it kind of befuddled me when we started, because my vision, see, when I grew up, I always thought the way it worked is Walt Disney is sitting in bed, and he sits up and he goes, Dumbo, and they just do it. And he goes to work, and he has the whole film in his head. In right. the opening shot, we right. see a stork, and he flies down. And so that was what I seriously think in the back of my head. I believe that's how it worked. Right. So I was waiting for John to come in and tell us, what are we going to do? And instead, he would come in and go, well, what do you think, guys? And I was like, what? This doesn't, how, what? So, you know, as it turns out, of course, John's enormously clever because mm -hmm. instead of just his brain, which is already pretty great, he gets all these other brains. And if you steer people the right way, you get all the ideas from a great community of people. The key is, of course, steering them the right way so it's not like Old right. West with, with stuff going everywhere. But yeah. Like but, a Tex Avery cartoon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was fun. Yeah, and so the, the, the trick is, is the, the, yeah, and it still works that way? Yeah. I mean, is it, I mean, you've been there for 25 years. It, is it, <laughs> it, it, does it still feel as uh, collaborative? Does it still feel as uh, give and take as it always has with, you know, a shelf full of Academy Awards and, and every other award imaginable probably is stuck, tucked away in your office somewhere? You would think that normally success changes things in that sort of way. It's changed. Yeah. And I say that to provoke, just to get you to go, what, it's changed? Uh, but it has, and Ed Catmull is fond of saying, it would be, if it didn't change, it would be dead, right? right? So since Toy Story, we did the whole film, I think, with like 120 people, right? Yeah. Which is maybe a third of the crew that we have now for a film. And uh, the studio was about 150, and now it's 1,200 or something. So it's definitely changed several yeah. times over, but yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of what you're asking about, yeah, it's still very much a collaborative uh, effort. Uh, everybody is able to contribute, and you know, from John Lasseter to janitors to anybody who sees the film and wants to send ideas or talk to us in the hall. And, yeah, if it's a good idea, I'll take it from anywhere. Well, it's funny because I was bragging before you came out that I saw the first hour of, of yeah, the yeah. new film today. And uh, it, it is interesting. You were saying that, you know, to get to the point where you're ready to show it to people like me, you showed it to the HR department one day, and then right. you showed it to, you know, the bookkeeping, and you showed it to whoever is sort of in the building that isn't doing anything for the next hour and a half. Come on in and, and, and have a look at this. And, you know, how seriously do you take these test audiences? We take it very seriously because what happens is <laughs> uh, over the course of five years, Strangely, you get kind of close to it, yeah. uh, and so sometimes it's hard to tell. Do I like this? Am I sick of it? Uh, where, where do I actually stand in this? And it's so clarifying to see with an audience. Sometimes they don't have to even, see, you're like, oh, just don't say anything. I know exactly what's wrong. Yeah. Having now seen it kind of through your eyes, yeah. it's yeah. really helpful. And of course, you know, the way we generally work is we'll have a concept, develop that for a while, uh, write a version, script it, we have a team of storyboard artists to kind of draw up a comic book version of, this, of the thing. We cut it on video with dialogue, music, and sound effects, mm. and we approximate what it's going to be like to watch the film when it's all done, even though it's just, you right. know, stick figure, pretty rough drawings yeah. usually. That whole process from concept to there is usually about a year and a half, and then thereafter, what happens is we screen it, everybody who we invited comes up to a, a room and tells us what they liked, what they didn't like, and we then, the creative team, kind of the core creative team goes away and says, what do you guys think, what, what should we, uh, how do we want to change this and adjust? And then we do that whole thing all over again. Mm. And we do it about seven or eight times before the film is really ready to produce. Well, I was surprised today, and we'll talk about Inside Out a little bit later on, mm -hmm. uh, but and I don't want to dwell on here because we've got so much else to do, but I was cool. surprised today uh, for the, the hour that I saw is beautiful and seamless. And the story 
uh, flows so beautifully. And then you spoke of it and said, oh yeah, no, we changed everything. We changed, uh, you know, there's some of the characters we changed out completely and we, yeah. and, and it was surprising to me because I have this idea that, uh, you know, it's enormously expensive, it's enormously time consuming, all those things to make any change in a big animated thing like that. How many rendering farms do you have going <laughs> 24 hours a day to, to make these changes? And, and it really... Uh, it it is, is horribly time consuming. Yeah. It is horribly expensive. Is it soul destroying a little bit when you've worked on... Yeah. Yeah, a little for, bit. <laughs> for months and months and months and then it just doesn't work? Yeah. Yeah. But I thank the lucky stars that we work at a company that is we allow ourselves to do that right. because I don't know none of us could be uh, you know it wouldn't come out well the first time it never does it right. always sucks at some point yeah. and so the fact that we're able to make mistakes and allow ourselves to try stuff and iterate and not have the pressure of it's got to be perfect the first time out yeah that's the only reason our stuff is any halfway good so so Toy Story mm. first one uh, you, you were one of the three writers which character did you most <laughs> identify with I'll go mm. back to that one well, okay, so Andrew, John's obviously directing, and Andrew, I think, really got a bead on, on Woody. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of identified more with Buzz for some <laughs> reason. I don't really know why. But um, I just felt like I could write for him and, and kind of act him out and things. So, yeah, that, that became kind of a good dynamic for the and, two of us. And over the course of how many years? That was about four, four and a half. Four and a half years. Yeah. And the first time you've worked on something of that size, mm -hmm. first time uh, that Pixar has stepped out and said, feature film, you know, listen, look at, look at what we're doing here. Um, what, what was going through your head during those four and a half years? Because it's all new. You're, do, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're breaking new ground. At that well, point. not only was it the first feature film, it was the first uh, feature film any of us had worked on. So, other than Joe Ramped, who came a little bit later to the party, he had worked on some features down at Disney, right. Brave Little Toaster, and uh, um, what was the other one, uh, he, uh, Rescuers uh, Down Under, he was had a story on that. Um, but other than he, none of us had experience. So, we were just flying by the seat of our pants, kind of saying, what feels right? What instinctively have we wanted to try? And, you know, we sort of made, we made, we made a list of things, of sort of cliches, that we wanted to avoid. We didn't want the Our Little Town song and the I Want song and all these different right. heroes or villains that grow huge in the third act, all the things that we had seen in, in animated films that we wanted to steer clear of. But then, you know, that, that's all easy to say at the beginning. Then you have the tough work of actually making it play, right. <laughs> which is just doing it over and over. And was there a moment, there must have been a moment, where you watched it with the HR department or somebody, mm -hmm. and you sat there and you're like, we don't have to change this anymore. No. No? It was never that. Well, when it's finished. <laughs> when it's finished. When it's when released. You can't change it anymore. I mean, yeah. it feels like we're working, working, working. Well, okay, that's uh, <laughs> somebody took it away. That's when it's done, really. Yeah. I think if we did not have deadlines, we would seriously still be working on Toy Story 1. <laughs> really? <right now. laughs> yeah, because we, we just can't stop otherwise. Well, and uh, one of the... Uh, Joe Grant, one of the legendary yeah. uh, Disney artists and storymen, he was responsible for uh, you know, story director on Fantasia, mm -hmm. and so you're you're you know that's back catalog. You're digging deep here. Was one of the people that helped you out with Monsters Inc. Yeah, and so I really I, I find it was really interesting as I, I read more and I, I learned more about this, how this very cutting edge technology that you're using and in a lot of ways pushing the ideas of what animated storytelling can be. Um, in Up, having a character die, all that sort of thing, which, I mean, we'd seen before, but, man, the first time I saw that with an audience, mm. I had to, you know, cover myself with a towel to stop <laughs> from getting soaked by the tears that were happening around me. I mean, it really pushed the envelope in terms of, of, of that sort of thing. But I've, I've been impressed all the way along that you uh, dig deep and, and uh, refer and pay homage to what came before. Well, that was one of the great pleasures for me in working on Toy Story and the success of Toy Story was that I got to meet these heroes of mine yeah. like Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. Um, unfortunately, Milt Call had passed. He was one of my favorite animators. Just, man, that guy can animate. We got to meet Chuck Jones and, and I struck, struck up a, a, a really great friendship with Joe, Joe Grant, right. as you mentioned, um, who I talked a lot about, like, what was it like doing this and what were you thinking on, you know, Dumbo and, and so on. And he, according to him, he, he was like, nothing has changed. 
it's the same thing we're doing now as we were then. And uh, one thing he always, uh, more than once, would mention is, what are you giving the audience to take home? Right. And that always kind of puzzled me at first. But as we talked about it, I realized what he meant was, okay, there's all the fun of bright colors and movement, but what the next day or in two months are people going to think about that is in your film? And usually that comes down to a, a, a something either of life truth, something that you've experienced in your own life, mm -hmm. or something that is really emotional. Those are the things that really mean something to you. So on every film that I've worked on, you know, we're always digging for something like that, something that's really going to matter to people. Do you have moments in films, not of your own films, but in other films when that sort of idea of sticky content mm -hmm. was placed in front of you and you're thinking, yeah, you know, think back to your childhood and movies that really affected you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have those moments that you can tell us about? Well, I mean, I was a huge Muppets fan mm -hmm. and the Muppet movie, I think, had that for me, you know, uh, Kermit's journey out and yeah. kind of believing in himself and all those things. Um, later, of course, uh, uh, other films that really bowled me over were uh, Paper Moon, uh, the Bogdanovich yep. film, the relationship between the two of Addy Prey, and you know, it's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, and there's there's tons of them, but you know, the other one that just uh, I'll mention is um, uh, the Station Agent by uh, Tom McCarthy. Yeah. The first time I saw that, I was like, wow, this is really simple, deceptively simple, and that's something that I admire and I wish I was better at, which is taking something and making it very very simple. Just because I think a lot of times we pack way too much stuff into. You know, I guess that happens after five years. You keep, eh, something else will fit in yeah. there too. Well, Just one more go. thing. Yeah. One more so. thing. Yeah. Yeah, the station agent with Bobby Cannavale and mm -hmm. Peter Dinklage. First time I had seen either of those actors. And it is a movie yeah. that stays stays with it you definitely, yeah, yeah. for long afterwards. So, uh, Monsters Inc., mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're developing this. Again, we're talking lengthy four or five year uh, turnaround on these things. Um, when you're first coming up with us, this idea, um, did you think back to you know what your monsters were like when you were a kid? That sort of thing that maybe kept you up at night or not, or what you imagined was under the bed. And if so, what were those things? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, just backing up a minute. Um, Toy Story finished, right. and everybody else was moving on to Bugs Life, and I said, well, what if I go off and develop something? There was no real. I didn't think I would direct it or anything. Right. I was just going to develop an idea that I was imagining John would direct. Um, but I thought to myself, like a lot of people, after that film, uh, Toy Story, came up to me and said, you know, I, I thought my toys came to life too. Uh, <laughs> and I was thinking, well, I wonder if there are other things that are like that, that we all kind of right. know as kids, know. And monsters, is, I knew there were monsters in the closet. Yeah. In mine, they were in the closet, yeah. not under the bed. Um, but Different strokes, man. That's right. Mine, and and the, the basement, the basement was scary. Yeah. Too. And I remember the day this... Uh, the day that they went from being monsters to mass murders that were hiding. <laughs> that was a big, pivotal That's thing. Like 14, 15 years yeah, old exactly. then? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was the, the kind of source of that. And then, you know, we, I got to work with great folks like Jeff Pigeon, uh, Jill Colton, who just would sit. We'd, what we did at that one was we got this big roll of butcher block, and I'd roll it out on the table and cut it off, and we'd just sit there and draw on this big table, and we'd just talk about, well, what if, uh, what if we had this guy who scares kids for a living, and, and we would talk and draw, and I'd cut out what I wanted, and I would, at the end of the day, go home and type something up, and we'd start the next day with, here's the story we came up with yesterday, right. and I'd pitch it to them, and then they'd go, well, but what about this, and we'd roll another sheet out, and we'd start again, and so we just kind of worked that way for a couple of, at least a couple of months before we had anything, right. and then you keep going from there, but... And that film was notable for any number of reasons, but I remember hearing that just to render the fur uh -huh. alone took an enormous amount of time, like a ridiculous amount of time, well, because no one had really made fur yeah. that looked like that before. Right. And so, is was that one of those situations where you, uh, you know, are talking to the to the computer animators and just go, "Yeah, I want fur." <laughs> and I want it to be really realistic. <laughs> do what you got to do. I, that, to that except happen. followed with, please, please, please. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, we early on kind of put a uh, flag in the ground and said, I think we're going to need fur for this. Right. And uh, we're also going to need, this doesn't get as much credit, but we're, this kid has been taken from her bedroom. So she's got to have like some sort of saggy, like a nightshirt or something like right. that. 
And that we had not done. If you go back and look at Toy Story, all the clothes are very form-fitting right. because they're articulated, they're, they're not dynamic, they don't move uh, unless they're keyframed to move. So between those two things, that really had the uh, technical directors sweating a little bit. And we actually, um, there's a, a, a small company that had done some pioneering work that we ended up buying. Uh, it was two guys, one's right. Canadian, I've forgotten. Uh, and uh, so they developed the basis of right. that simulation software that we still use today. And Ray Harryhausen was an influence yeah. on you. <laughs> Ray Harryhausen, you know, well, room full of animation yeah. geeks. You, don't you know to, who Ray? I don't, don't need to I don't have anyone. to explain who Ray Harryhausen is to you. <laughs> uh, but Ray Harryhausen was a was a big influence on you in terms of the monster design. I understand. Tell me because I I love his work. I love the the idea of the stop motion animation because it feels organic and it feels it feels like someone's hands were really yeah. there but the monsters were also really cool they were and really that's cool. the yeah that's the other part of for it for sure and of course that's we uh, paid homage to him by naming the sushi restaurant after that's him that's right yeah. um, i'd say yeah the monsters in the film were part Harryhausen a large part muppets in fact we had to kind of steer away so that they didn't look too much like some of the muppets right. a little bit of um uh uh um, what's his name? Uh, Maurice Sendak. Yep. yep. Um, and the there are all these things that, like, okay, I love that, but we can't do that because that's already been done. So you want to make your own kind of find your own piece of ground, you know? Yeah. We're just uh, we were talking here about the rendering. It, it, according to my research here, it took 11 to 12 hours to render a single strand of Sully's 2.3 million individual strands of hair. Hmm. Can that possibly be I right? I don't think that adds up. <laughs> we'd still we'd, be rendering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It did take a long time. We should check little, that one. Yeah, well, you know what? We're just going to put a line okay. through it. No, we're not going to go back to that one. All right. um, your kids were six and three when mm -hmm. you made this. And again, Inside Out, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. But there is some personal stuff in that film. Uh, is there anything of your kids in this film? Or is this something of you looking back? Yeah, in, in Monsters, Inc. Or is this you primarily looking back? Um, what happened was, okay... I, I love work. You know, as soon as I got to Pixar, I would just stay there all day and all night. My wife, when we first got married, would we'd eat dinner and then she'd come and play video games and fall asleep until I would wake her up at two in the morning when I was done animating and we'd go home and I'd go back to work because wow. I just couldn't get enough. <laughs> and then we had a kid. Right. And um, so Monsters started at about the same time the kid did. And, uh, <laughs> and as I was working on the film, I was like, this is great. And then my wife would say, he smiled for the first time. And you missed it, because you're at work. Right. And I was like, well, how do I make this go? Because I want to be in both places, but I can't. And that really is what became the story, the sort of emotional backbone of, of monsters. Uh, a Sully, who's a monster who loves his job, suddenly gets this kid, which is at first scary and weird, which is true of real kids. Uh, <laughs> and, and then he grows to care for her more than he does the job. And so you know, it's that impossible struggle with no answer that I think makes for good stories. And I mean, I think it, it refers back to what you were talking about earlier, that the stuff, the sticky content, is yeah. the stuff that comes from an emotional moment or an emotional epiphany or something that, that may be only really known to you, but it comes through in the story somehow. Yeah, yeah. and it's weird, like, as other people have noticed this too, that the more particular and specific you are in the storytelling, the more generally it applies. Right. If you try to generalize, then nobody really gets anything, but if you're very specific and, and personal about it, um, it seems to resonate more. Right. Right. Billy Crystal is one of the things I think that made people really stand up and notice this film as well uh, because of the voice work and, uh -huh. and that sort of thing. He was approached for Buzz Lightyear, I heard, and, and mm -hmm. said no. Uh, yeah. And how did you convince him to come on board for Monsters, Inc.? We said, hey, Billy, would you? And he said yes. Because <laughs> uh, he was sort of kicking himself. I think he right. said, I got bad advice from an agent or something. <laughs> and he was kicking himself that he, uh, he had passed on Toy Story. Yeah. So um, I remember like going to present to him, whoa, we have this film, where is it, Mars? And he, he was already kind of signed on, he told us later. So um, he was great. And it yeah. was a lot of fun working, especially that was really the first film that we got both of our lead actors in the studio at the same time. Right. And uh, uh, see, I don't ever really understand how you can record everyone separately and still, I mean, I understand you can edit it together, you can make, but the, the dynamics, it always seems to me like the dynamics just couldn't be there. 
but they are somehow. They, well, they can make it work. But you more and more seem to be bringing actors in together in Inside Out. There were moments that you had yeah. uh, more than one cast member recording lines. You realize uh, when this happens how fortunate we are and how much control we have versus live action because sometimes right. actors spark and you get great stuff. Right. Other times they hesitate and falter and you know we've had experiments of of actors reading opposite each other and it was awful and there was no chemistry and, and we had to go back and bring them all in individually and mm. kind of create that. Right. Um, and, and really I credit the editors, you know, starting with Lee Unkrich on Toy Story who, who create these, it's, it, you know, you'll have Tom Hanks recorded in LA and Tim Allen recorded in New York yeah. three months later and yet in the scene they're both together arguing about being stuck under the truck, you know, yeah, yeah. and you totally believe that they're talking to each other and that's good editing. Good editing and just part of the magic that makes yeah. them work. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and that you know, good direction too. Mm -hmm. that, that the director is able to, and I'm not John. <laughs> John is in that one. So, um, but but it, I mean, it's a different directorial muscle, I would imagine, than it would be in live action because you're listening for something very specific in one person's performance at a time. Yeah. Yeah, when I first started, I thought my job was to have everything in my head, almost like a pre-recorded uh, vision of what it should be. And then I would listen and try to direct to that. And I realized, especially as I work with amazing actors like Bill Hader and yeah, Mindy yeah. Kaling, really what I want to do is set the table and let, let them play um, because I'm going to get better stuff, kind of like we talked at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you're able to kind of say, okay, this is what we're doing right in here, but don't define it so precisely, then there's still a lot of, uh, of experimenting and playing to do. But that's got to be kind of scary, though, the idea of going, or maybe, maybe I'm just too controlling, but the idea of going into a project that you don't really know exactly where it's going to end up five years from now, and it's going to cost a lot of money, and there's a lot of people relying on, on this particular thing to do well. That has to be nerve-wracking. Well, you want to know enough about where you're going to be able to, to, to lead them. Right. <laughs> if you're like, I don't know what's going on, then <laughs> nobody ever. else is yeah. either. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, so, for example, I guess uh, even in talking to animators, rather than saying, um, okay, he comes in and he very quickly puts his hand on the glass and then 15 frames later he goes like this, right. I'm going to say, instead of that, I'm going to say, you know that feeling when you come home from a long hike and you are just drenched with sweat and you're so thirsty, that is what he's feeling like as he comes in. And that way, they can create, they can put in their own specifics right. of how that's going to happen. Um, you know what I mean? And so, so you're setting a scene. More of an emotional the, yeah. thing for yeah. them. And the same with lighting, same with uh, the live actors. You know, as much as I can kind of create the scene in their head and describe the feeling, then they're going to fill in their own specifics and bring great ideas to it. Right. Let's talk about Wally. Cool. And uh, this started from a visual. Uh, from what I understand, according to Andrew Stanton, uh, it, just the thought of this lonely robot still doing his job after hundreds of years. And do, is, is, am I correct yeah. on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what was the visual and what did it mean to you? You worked uh, on the story on Wally. Yeah, I pitched that at the same time I pitched uh, Monsters, Inc. Yeah. And then again, that didn't really, fl John didn't take to it. Um, so I filed it away on the shelf. And then after Monsters, I was like, all right, I'm ready with the next one. It's going to be Wally. At that time, we called it Trash Planet. Um, and it didn't really stick again. Right. Uh, I realized this is just not working for me. But luckily, uh, Andrew loved it. And so he kind of took it and carried the torch. But yeah, it was really the, um, that pure visual of panning across a, tra a planet that's just full, full of trash and then a little wall and you'd see very neatly just the scale of the amount of time that this character had been working and mm -hmm. working and working. And the thrill of doing something with no dialogue. Well, I was going to say, it's a nervy project because there's virtually no dialogue for most of the film. Yeah, you know, people have said that, and I've always scratched my head. I'm like, we did uh, Luxo Jr. Everybody loves Luxo Jr. There's right. no dialogue at all. To me, it, feels, it felt like the most completely given thing in the world that, right. that we could, I had no doubt about it. But I would imagine, though, that when you don't have the dialogue to fall back on, that the character design then becomes a million times more important. There again, I think it's almost the acting, because I don't know if you've ever seen like either puppets or mimes where uh, you'll have no movement in the face, mm -hmm. and yet still, just through the movement, the timing of things, right. you're able to get complete 
uh, intention and what the character wants. And it's, it's really a thrill when you see it done well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, I mean, the design is fantastic, of course, and, and it has this amazing flexibility to get all of that. Mm -hmm. So where, that, that, where I struggled, and I think Andrew really succeeded, and, and the, the hard work of that was Act Two, because we had the setup, right. and we had a lot of fun developing all the shtick and things that he would find and so on, but then what happens? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the hard part. What's the story? Yeah. yeah. And again, are we talking months, years? Well, let's see. I guess in total, I would have spent maybe six months on it mm -hmm. in two different stints uh, before Andrew took it. And I think, I don't remember the timing because I wasn't on it at that point, but right. I think it was at least four years after that that they finally released it. And without, I mean, I called this film nervy. I think I probably did at the time when it came out uh, because it felt different to me than, than a lot of other uh, entertainment uh, or animated entertainment, certainly. And I wonder without reducing anything to a formula, mm -hmm. because you, it, I don't think you agree with me that it's as nervy as I think it is, but um, because you were there, you were on the inside looking out maybe, okay. but um, without reducing anything down to a formula, are there, are there Pixar traits that, that you can identify and perhaps you know, suggest that, well, Wally you know, is more like Toy Story than, than I think it is? Well, I would say it's, it goes back even further than that. All the short films that John did were sans dialogue. So yeah. you have Tin Toy, Luxo, yeah. Red's Dream. All of these are inanimate objects brought to life beautifully just through movement. I mean, right. Red, this unicycle, I guess you guys have probably seen that. Um, it's just really beautifully done. And you totally know what's going on in that character's head and what he feels like, and or she, I don't know who it is. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it really, that film almost goes back to, in, in a sense, even further than that, like Chaplin. Right. and Keaton, and those kind of things. We looked at a lot of those films along the way, and the animators did, I know. Yeah, those films, I mean, I, I think that the, you talk about Chaplin and, and Keaton, uh, it, those films played so universally because there were obviously no dialogue, so yeah. they could play everywhere in the world. But they also uh, focused on really primal stuff, stuff that everyone the world over could understand, love, Right. Falling Down is always funny, uh, yep. you know, yep. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. All in and, Wally, right? Yeah, yeah, it is, it's all in Wally, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Now, uh, when Pixar, it, we, we talked about it, it seems new, but uh, it's been described in the interviews that I've read with you and, and some others as an old-style studio still. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, can you, can you describe to me, and we've touched on this a little bit, about it being a place where writers and directors really shape their films, which I guess is where the old-style studio idea comes from. Is that it? Well, I like to think of it, I, I wasn't there, obviously, but right. the old um, Hollywood studio system, like if you think of MGM or Warner Brothers, these are studios that had thousands of employees, yeah. and they were on salary. So the cameraman, whether they were working or not, was coming in every Monday and getting a paycheck. Right. Um, and they would work with you know, John Ford to you know, whoever, whoever, uh, yeah. whoever they were, were working for. And Pixar is like that. So we have these amazing craftsmen and, and artists and... Uh, that, that have been there for as long as, you know, 20 years or however long they've been there, and they get better every film. They learn from that, and they apply all that knowledge to the next one. So nowadays, as you know, in live action, you assemble a crew, scrappy, you put everybody together, you make the film, and then they all scatter, and they mm. have, have to look for other work. So it's hard to, even sometimes your key people, you know, right. most directors have a DP or whoever that they come back to, but sometimes they're on another show, and so... Um, at Pixar, we have the benefit of all that shared, learned knowledge that stays in the company, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool, and completely, like, possibly that's the only place that still happens yeah, on that I scale. Think, I yeah. think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we want to talk about Up. I'm going to show a clip from Up to okay. the people in the booth. So I'm going to do that in just a sec, though. I want to introduce... <laughs> So, how close was the original idea for Up <laughs> to, yeah, what we see here? Because I know uh, in the original idea, there was no young boy. Russell wasn't in there yet. Uh, so, perhaps tell us a little bit about what the original idea was, if you can remember, because uh, it probably changed and morphed many times. Yeah, well, it depends on how far back you go to define original. <laughs> right. <laughs> because uh, this one actually started from a story about two princes who lived in a floating city on an alien planet. Believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, 
uh, as we developed that, it was interesting at first. And then it w went to this weird place of like, who do I identify with yeah. here? I don't understand. And, and, and after a while, I realized, okay, we're getting nowhere, and I've got to get something that people can relate to. Right. So we stripped away everything but the essential elements of that story, which to me, uh, the reason I was attracted to it was I'm not an extrovert. So nobody told me that as a director, all you do is go around and talk to people all day. <laughs> um, and so uh, most of the time, at the end of Monsters, I would want to crawl into my desk right. and just kind of rock in a fetal position for a while. And so the idea of escaping, of floating away, sounded really appealing. And so that's what the floating city was. Right. And we said, well, what if we make it a floating house? And well, it shouldn't just be floating. It should have some sort of logic, maybe balloons. Yeah, right. OK. And so we came up with this visual. And it was really intriguing. And I couldn't get it out of my head. And then we worked backwards from there to figure out why is this guy floating his house? Well, who is he? Yeah. Why is he floating? Why didn't he just take the train or something? <laughs> there must be a really good reason he's floating his house. And where is he going? So that then created this whole backstory of his wife and their love for each other and the promise that they'd made that was unfulfilled and led to that whole sequence that you were talking about um, that people uh, like and, and cry about, which is I, I always take as the greatest compliment when people tell me, I cried when I saw that. Boy, did they ever. Um, I saw, <laughs> I saw uh, you know, as today, when I saw the, the first hour of the new film, I saw about 45 minutes of Up long before it was mm. was open, you were here and, and showed it to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, the response that it got, I don't know if you remember, but the, the, the response was really electrifying. People really felt like they were seeing something really special. And cool. uh, yeah, it was cool. Yeah. It was a cool thing to be a part of and, and to see, to be it was one of those moments to be in an audience when you're seeing something that you know, even though you're only seeing a portion of it, is going to be great. <laughs> And, and it really was quite something. And that scene was one of them. There, there was oh, like yeah. a lot of the <laughs> kind of, you know, <laughs> response from people that, uh, um, but uh, uh, again, you know, I, 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 I use the word nervy again a little bit. I mean, you don't really, I guess, the Pixar films aren't specifically made for kids. They are made with an audience in mind, but you don't really think, from what I understand, you don't think about kids specifically when you're putting oh. these together, right? And, and I would suggest that was very obvious to me after seeing Up. Yeah, Up was Bob Peterson, who's writer and co-director, and Jonas and I wanting to make each other laugh right. and, and feel something. And so we wrote for ourselves. Always, you know, we have, we all have kids, and yeah. my kids were young at that time, and so I knew they were going to be watching it, so I didn't want to scar them or anything. Yeah. You know, I want <laughs> something that they'll relate to and be interested in. Um, but we really are writing for ourselves, um, and not to be selfish about it, because I think in some ways that's our job as filmmakers is first of all be an audience, right. you know, um, and we're sort of a surrogate audience until we can get a real one, until we have something that we can show to a real audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any uh, thoughts or any trepidation about making the uh, main character sort of a curmudgeonly old man? That was one of the, the, uh, the key th buy-ins for me. Right. Um, Bob Peterson and I were just saying like, well, who's in the house and who's flying and, and I think Bob first said, you know, I've always wanted to do something with a grouchy old man. I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I had drawn him, you know, like growing up and stuff. There's something funny about, right. and I think uh, you give him license, right. you know, because he is an old man, he's kind of weaker than like a healthy young young guy, so you, he, he can be grouchy, yeah, right. and I don't dislike him for it. You and know? Ed Asner is the perfect voice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Did you try, was he always, uh, I mean, was he, was he like the first choice or was he, he went, um, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I met we'd him. show up at like recording that. sessions and you'd go, you again. <laughs> you know, like, okay, this is perfect. <laughs> so. Do you write with people in mind? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, what usually happens is at first you kind of design the character um, based on, I don't know what exactly, something that's inside of you or observations that you've seen in other people. And then you design the character. In most, I think all cases um, on the films that I've worked on, the character's already designed and built before they're cast. Right. So, you know, it's always curious to me when people say, uh, oh, uh, Mike Wazowski looks just like Billy Crystal. Yeah. Like, I don't think Billy Crystal would take that as a compliment. Uh, he's one-eyed, green guy. But I think what happens is the animators listen and they watch the video that we shoot of the actors and they capture these great little nuances to tie 
the visuals to the audio. Right. And so that's why they tend to look like the characters. Yeah, because I would have thought that the, the Ed Asner character looks like Ed Asner, but I guess it wasn't really planned that way. No, much. we had designed him first, and then we kind of found Ed Asner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, as we just saw, the dogs talk, but they don't talk as the way dogs traditionally do in films. Was, what was the decision behind not having talking animals, or um, real talking animals, real, real <laughs> talking animals? That was inherited from another idea um, and as Bob and I were working on this other thing, this character came out, uh, this talking dog, and it, it, it was through some other reason in this original story. But at the beginning of Up, <laughs> we got this note for a long time, uh, that as we had showed this, the film, um, John uh, Lasseter and, and Andrew would say, it feels like a list of things that you like uh, <laughs> thrown together into this one movie. What they didn't know is that earlier we'd made a list uh, of things that we liked, and we and that dog was in there. So right. it it was um, it was really born out of uh, looking at we we had dogs. I had a dog, and, and Bob had a dog, and we'd both do voices for our dogs. Right. And Bob, that's the voice Bob did for his dog, and they're all kind of you know they're a little limited in their intelligence, and so <laughs> the the I have just met you and I love you yeah, and all yeah, that stuff yeah. came from from Bob, just <laughs> goofing around. So. You mentioned John Lasseter. I, you know, uh, I was at Pixar uh, a while ago, and people were telling me about the uh, short film, uh, the Steamboat Willie film, the, the the new one or the newish one, nominated for an Academy Award, and how they were using Walt Disney's actual voice in it. Oh yeah. And except for one word, there was the, they couldn't find one word, and so <laughs> they went to a sound editor and they just sort of had him create the word using. Sounds that Walt made, but it, they, they formed the word. Huh. Apparently, Lasseter watched it, and he went, it's great, except for, and he yeah. pinpointed <laughs> the one yeah. word that wasn't authentic <laughs> in the thing. Sounds um, like John. And, you know, whether that's apocryphal or not, I don't know, but that's what I've been told. What does he like to work with? Because the eye for detail, the, the incredible uh, way that he works, I think, must be something. Yeah, to that, was, with that totally day -day. sounds like John. He has a real, I think his way in on some of these, everybody comes at these films from a different place. And I think John's, from what I've observed, is through detail. Right. Like, I challenge you to find something that John doesn't know extreme amounts of right. knowledge already. Right. Your shoes. Right. Oh, he, I visited this factory once. And the, <laughs> the seams here, the, the, the way that, that the, the molding yeah. goes, he, and he remembers everything. So he's amazing. I, I literally, okay, we were looking at, uh, crew jackets for Monsters University, and he said, "Oh, let me let me see it because I used to have a um, w they were sort of Letterman jacket style." Right. He said, "I had one when I was in eleventh grade, and I studied the seam work. And let me take a look." <laughs> and he sure enough, like he he knew everything about this jacket. This, like what? Who would who would have thought that? So he really just I, he is an amazing detail, uh, just eye for detail. And then of course. Uh, uh, amazing ability to put all that together and, and work with people. He's such a collaborative guy. You know, on, on the films that he directs, he just brings out the best in everybody, and everybody's excited to work on those films. So it's, it's he, he also, I can't think of anyone else in the world who uh, is better suited for what he does than John. John, I feel like he was doing what he does now, even probably when he was 17, that is creating these worlds collaborating with people, bringing stuff together, thinking about everything from the very basic story inklings all the way through to marketing and uh, the merchant, the toys. He loves toys, so he's the whole package. I don't know how he'd do without him. Maybe he doesn't sleep. I don't think he does. Maybe he doesn't I sleep. I really don't. <laughs> now, you have said uh, several times, we're, uh, I'll move along to Inside Out. We, wanna, oh, cool. we want to uh, get to that before we run out of time. And you've said several times that when you're conceiving these stories that often you try and imagine what they would be like without dialogue. Mm -hmm. And is that a, a, a starting place that you came from for Inside Out? No. 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 Inside Out from the very get-go. So that was um, me just thinking, okay, what else can we do here that would be fun in animation? And, and uh, I don't remember exactly my train of thought that led to emotions, emotions as characters. And what if we brought them and personified them, sort of like you know uh, uh, Seven Dwarfs or something like that. It's an analogy that uh, Jonas came up with later. Um, that each one of these guys is a super caricatured, uh, pushed, uh, extreme personality who 
understands the world through their own lens, right? And so... Um, and only through their own lens. So yeah. anger is always angry. Like exactly. there's no downtime for anger and joy is always joyful and... Exactly. So, so that was one that even from the very beginning I kind of thought oh, this is an ensemble comedy. Right. This is going to have probably a lot of dialogue and uh, it's going to come, a lot of the humor is going to come out of the approach that each one of these characters mm -hmm. bring to that and, and in conflict with each other. So. And this story, uh, again, we talk about the sticky content, we talk about a personal connection to them. You have a very personal connection to this story, and uh, one of which is your daughter, yeah. who was a happy-go-lucky 11-year-old, not so much <laughs> when she was 12. Yeah. And, and so, um, starting there, and you also had suggested uh, that perhaps your growing up was a little rocky in some ways as well, yeah, I which I think is all... I think it's why I became an animator, right? Yeah. I don't have to talk to people if I can draw. I can right. sit here and draw. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, my daughter actually did the voice of young Ellie at the very beginning of Up, yeah, yeah. and she was a lot like that kid in that movie. Um, and then, yeah, when she got to be 11, she was much more quiet and, and changed a lot, you know? Um, and we were like, what's going on inside of her head? And then I was thinking, well, let's find out. So we <laughs> kind of used that as a setting. The kid is both a character and a setting yeah. in the film. And it's really been one of the hardest things I've ever done, probably the hardest, because uh, we're making up an entire world that doesn't yeah. really exist. Uh, we because, have because it's not inside the brain; it's inside the mind. Right. It's a different thing. It's a, it's a, it sounds like splitting hairs, but it is a different thing. Yeah, we don't have dendrites and blood vessels yeah. and stuff. We have long-term memory yeah. or dream production or subconscious. You know, places that these guys get to go and mm -hmm. travel in inside the mind, which has been a blast. Abstract thought. You know, yeah. things that could only really be done in animation. Um, so that's been, it's been really fun. It's been, a re it, it's really interesting. This will give nothing away, but I, I saw the first clip from this at D23 about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. And uh, it's, it's, it, it struck me that it was being played, the clip that I saw anyway, it felt broad to me. I thought, oh, mm -hmm. this is gonna be like an all out, bro very broad comedy. Is that the dinner? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I you don't... You guys may have seen it. That's, that's, that's the basis of that first trailer. Yeah, it's the basis of the first trailer. So they're having dinner and, and the young girls, you know, having some mood swings. Yeah. And her parents are using their emotions to try and figure out right. what's going on and they're not connecting particularly well. Right. And it's a very funny clip. Um, but the, the movie isn't exactly that. The movie is very funny. But the movie, I was really struck with how uh, deeply it gets into the idea that as children grow up, they change in uh, big ways. And we see this in, in uh, illustrated in, in her brain or in her mind, uh, using very sort of easy to understand ideas about, you know, ideas are in little balls and that kind mm -hmm, of thing. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it lays it out for us. But there's something that's really uh, beautifully deep about the, the idea of this child changing in front of you. And I, 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 I watched it and I thought, you know, I, I think this is only the kind of subtle representation of this that only a parent could really understand or have made. Well, thanks. It was a film that we started to tell from the kid's point of view. And then as Ronnie Del Carmen, who's uh, the co-director on the film, realized, wait a minute, we're telling our story as parents yeah. watching the kid. And so that central relationship is what is thrown into question, Joy and her kid. Because all the emotions, I mean, this is something that um, Mindy Kaling, we were talking uh, a couple weeks ago, and she, she said she what she loved about the film is that all the emotions are there for their kid. And right. there's something kind of comforting to know that you have this team of advisors that's working for you, that are plugging away, trying to make sure that you don't get taken advantage of, that you don't get hurt, that you don't get poisoned, you know, all the, everybody has their own job. Yeah. And um, it's, it's pretty cool. Was there a note from the collective hive mind at Pixar that you can think of particularly that helped shape what this story is? Because again, I know that the story changed a number of times, but there was, was there one thing that somebody in the group said that, that shifted the focus of what the film might have been? Well, I mean, we got so much help from John, from Andrew, everybody along the way. Um, there was a, uh, I don't may, mean to make this about me, but we were kind of two and a half, three years into the project. You know, the thing is called In Conversation with Pete Doctor. Oh. 
You can make right. it about okay. you if you want uh, uh, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were about three years into the project, and we were at the point where we needed to get approvals and move forward right. and move into production. And we were coming up to a screening, and I was like, something about this just isn't working. And um, I, let's see, how do I tell this without giving too much away of the story now that I've gotten into it? Well, I'll say one thing that we were really playing with a lot at that time was fear, because mm -hmm. fear was a big part of my junior high life, right. probably controlled way more than I'd care to admit. And so that was a central thread, that relationship between joy and fear. And um, I realized uh, in this moment of weakness that, that, okay, this film's not working. We're going to have to move into production. I've got nothing. What if I, what if I just leave and go to Mexico? Uh, what if I get <laughs> fired? Um, what are the things that I'm going to miss? What are the things that really matter to me? And it was my friends and my family. And I started thinking about why that is. And I think, yeah, these are people that I've been happy and had good times with, but they're also people I've been mad at mm -hmm. and scared for and sad with. And I realized, wait a minute, emotions are at the core of the most important thing in our entire lives, and that is the relationships that we have with each other. And that is something we're already using in the film. If we just steer it the right way, we can make this really something deep and meaningful, I think. Right. So we'll, we'll leave it to you to see if, if we did it. But. Yeah, well, it, it, the, the, the hour that I saw has that. Um, and I, I, I know that, the, the, how long will it be in total? It's about 84 minutes, yeah, 85. Yeah, another half hour. Yeah. Um, the, the Pixar, uh, you often do research trips uh, yeah. for your things. And I know for Up, you went to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I think you went to Argentina. Um, this was presumably a little less scenic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> take, you know, what, what sort of research did you do? If <laughs> well, we did a bunch of stuff that you would probably expect. Like we talked to psychologists, right. neurologists. Uh, did as much study on sort of the, the basic buildup of, the, of how the brain works as we possibly could. But then we also did weird things like the art department visited an egg farm um, and I think tomato oh, for the, processing. Oh, for the inside of the mind when the, like all well, the little core memories and yeah, things, Yeah, because you'll right? see yeah. we have all these memories everywhere and they have to be sorted right. and cataloged in some way. So we thought, well, that's already being done in, in mass market, you know, food. So let's go check out how they do it and maybe we can learn some stuff. So. There was, uh, there's all these kind of weird tangent things that, yeah. that always come up, but that's part of the fun. Yeah, it is part of the fun. And, and the film is very rich visually. One of the things that I hadn't noticed before, but uh, noticed today when I saw it on the mm. big screen, was that e each of the emotions are these sort of amorphous, they, they, they have a little, they, they don't feel real. They feel like you could put your hand through them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a ghostly kind of feel. Not ghostly, but there's a, there's a different feel to them than real world characters. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that they looked like emotions, the way we feel about stuff, yeah. not just little humans, flesh yeah. and blood. So, so they're a fog with these little frontward-facing discs that, that look like uh, roiling atoms or something. Yeah. And hopefully the whole thing is subtle enough that you, you, at first, you just take them as characters, and then when you look close, you're like, oh, wow, what's happening there? So... Especially in close-ups, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful, yeah. yeah. It, it, it sort of put me in the mind of uh, Tinkerbell and sort of that, oh, that uh -huh. old-school Disney kind of, you know. Yeah, Joy, when she moves really fast, she kind of leaves some of her particles behind. Yeah. So you get this kind of glittery effect. And yeah. there is something that that looks a little different than uh, the, the real-world computer animation. Uh, it, when we're in the mind, uh, particularly Joy, who tends to move a little faster mm -hmm. than everyone else, played by Amy Poehler, mm -hmm. um, but her legs stretch and things. Yeah. That, it's more like Tex Avery. It's more like a, yeah. an homage to what came before it. Well, going back to you know my roots, I love those films and Chuck Jones and Tex Avery especially. Um, so it was finally getting to a place where you know in the early days of Toy Story and stuff, we couldn't really do that. I mean, you could for very short amounts of time, but you right. couldn't sustain it for a feature. Yeah. So this is finally, a f uh, we had developed technology that allowed us to do these great stretches and you know distortions and things. Um, and if used properly in the right hands, it can be really cool. Right. Of course, it can also be used for evil <laughs> if, if it's in the wrong hands. In other words, it can, it can be really kind of off-putting and odd. There can be know. too much. Yeah. yeah, so that means this film, even more than any of the rest, I think, relied on great artistry in the in the animation thank you so yes, much for being you. here this evening thank you so Pete doctor thank you, thank you so much
Really great insight uh, into the uh, process. Inside Out opens June 19th. Yeah. yeah. Buy your tickets now, people. And uh, Yeah, and in fact, now that you mention Inside Out, you know. um, we brought uh, something that you might be interested to see. I don't know, are you interested? <laughs> we have... Uh, I, I feel like they might be. <laughs> we have the first, uh, what is it, like 10 minutes, 7 minutes of the film. So, um, <laughs> see? so I'll, say, I'll say thank you and thank you. Thank you. And then we'll get out of here. Amazing. You can watch the movie. Thank you very much, everybody.